Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the first ever type conference. Isn't it amazing? I hope you're all having a super awesome time. This is SJ's Declassified Mental Survival Guide where I'm gonna take you on a journey through uh, what it's like <laughs> to work in metal additive. My name is SJ and I'm an additive applications engineer for Siemens Energy. Today we're gonna go over a little bit of an introduction, talk about you know the additive process, part design, support design, crimping, heat treatment briefly, and you know, then I'm gonna let you get back to the super amazing conference that's going on. How's that sound? Good? Okay, cool. So to start. My first day in additive manufacturing was not all sunshine and rainbows like I had thought it was going to be. It was actually uh, pretty rough. Metal additive is far more hands-on than I ever expected it would be. And on my first day, we got really hands-on in uh, taking apart an entire metal additive machine. And while we were taking apart said machine, one of these cute little screws that you see that I was taking apart happened to get sucked up into the wet separator, which is basically this giant vacuum that sucks up the metal powder, mixes it up with like a liquid solution and then renders it inert so that it doesn't get all explosive when you're disposing of it. And I was devastated because, you know, it smelled really bad. I had to take the wet separator apart, dig through all the sludge, to find this screw. And I had very little help doing it. It was very much a literal sink or swim type of first day that I had. But I persevered and I endeavored on. And this whole talk is to go over that and how you conquer those kinds of challenges. So the advent manufacturing process, specifically for metals, I should put that in there. Uh, number one, part design. You get the part, what do you do with it? Number two, build setup. What you do with it, how you put it on the plate, how you set it up in the machine. Three, machine setup. Then there's printing, build removal, which is taking it out of the machine, that, that's its own process. Heat treatment, cutting the parts off of the plate, machining and you know other post-processing, surface finishing, and then quality inspections. Unfortunately, I don't have all the time in the world today, so it looks like we're only going to be covering these steps. So let's get into it. Part design, 3D printing constraints, learning how to, sell, how, learning how to set healthy boundaries for yourself and for your prints. Here are the basics. This is pretty much what you need to know before you get started. Make sure you confront, well not confront, Here's what you need to know before you get started. When you get the part from your customer, sit them down and have a talk over these basic design things, especially if they've never designed for additive before. You wanna go over wall thickness, pin diameter, which is basically how thin can you print a little stick, um, hole sizes, powder escape holes. Make sure that you push your customer to let you put in as many powder escape holes as you can. I promise you it is worth it. You don't want to sit there powder moving for the rest of your life. Um, make sure you go over overhangs. That's another big important one. And by overhangs, I mean like unsupported edges. Oh, that's the next one. Aspect ratios, which are basically the ratio of how tall the part is to like how much square footage it takes up on the plate. Tall, t tall thin pieces tend to behave differently than other pieces. So you really want to pay attention to that. And then the other thing is tolerancing. How tight of a tolerance does the customer need it? Because that's gonna affect your post-processing steps and overall cost. <clears throat> now constraints as an additive engineer. So you may not think that this is important and you may think that this is all fluff, but I promise, just hear me out, okay? Designing constraints for yourself in the workplace is a really important step in being a successful additive. Constraints as an additive engineer are also gonna to lead to a successful build for your career. So number one, make sure you assess what's really important to you. Define your values as an engineer early on before you really enter into like any kind of career workforce, before you decide like what company you're working for, to decide what your values are 
and check that against the company's values. Number two, set those set boundaries around your values. And then number three, maintain those boundaries through practice. So here's what I'm talking about. When I first got into metal additive, like on that first day, it was so much of a boys club. Like it was literally all boys and me. <laughs> and to, to try and fit in and to try and get with the work culture, I adopted a lot of toxic habits um, so that I could assimilate better. A lot of those are listed here. Some examples include working late, taking calls at any time of the day, never turning down any print jobs that I was offered, being the yes person. So this means that if a customer wants a part that's seemingly impossible, yeah, I was that dummy that always said, yes, sure, of course, we can print it. We'll, we'll find a way, I'll find a way for you. <sighs> oh, young SJ. And my biggest, you know, unhealthy, like, constraint, one of my biggest unhealthy boundary was I was always afraid to ask for help because the boys were, it was just a boy club. So if I asked for help, I just felt like, you know, that weak little girl in the room that was always, you know, disrupting everyone's schedule because I needed help with every little thing. I couldn't have been further from the truth. <clears throat> so a large part of the reason why I had adopted all of these really unhealthy boundaries in the beginning was because I'm super introverted. I know, I'm, I'm on camera right now seeming like a normal human being, but in, if you meet me like in real life, I'm actually pretty quiet and pretty introverted. And learning how to navigate a corporate space as an introvert was <laughs> really, really hard. I absolutely hate talking on the phone and it's not just because I'm a millennial. So for all my other introverts out there, get your screenshot key ready because I'm about to help you out. So how to navigate setting your boundaries as an introvert. Let's go. Okay, number one, take time to respond. Um, when someone sends you an email with a request for something, take a minute to think about it before you immediately say yes. So this is one of my go-to phrases. Um, do, 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 someone emails me asking for something and then I say something along the lines of, hmm, maybe, I'm not sure right now. Uh, I'll check the schedule and get back to you by tomorrow. Easy. They know that they've been listened to. You haven't done anything wrong. It's totally fine to give them a delayed and informed response. They're more than happy with that. Number two, communicate as clearly as possible. This is very specifically in regards to your boss because sometimes bosses are doing a whole lot of things that we can't see and they're juggling a whole lot of information that they can't share. And it's hard for them to communicate some of that to us sometimes. So one of the ways that I communicate with my boss when I'm, we're having difficulties is if I spend my time on X, it's gonna impact the schedule for this by N number of days. Or if I spend my time on X, there won't be enough budget left to do Y. And number three, don't be afraid to ask why. This goes towards your suppliers, it goes towards your boss, whoever you might be working with. Sometimes it gets really like frustrating when everybody is being super demanding of your time and of your energy. And it helps a lot to know why that is. It helps take the stress off of you. So don't be afraid to, to ask why. And by that, I mean, if your boss is being super demanding, say something like, tell me about why you need this done in this time constraint. And just knowing the backstory about like why it's so important sometimes can help you figure out how to prioritize all of the things that you have on your plate for that day. Okay? It's not that bad. I'm gonna pause here, let you take a screenshot. Okay, cool. Moving forward. Build setup. <sighs> We're gonna talk about supports and how to set up effective support networks. Build setup. We're gonna talk about supports and how to set up effective support networks for yourself. Supports, why do you need supports? I mean, the customer should obviously email you a perfect additive part every single time, right? No. <laughs> so you need supports because number one, they act as a foundation. Number two, they help hold it down. 
And number three, they help take the heat off. This goes for supports when designing your part, as well as choosing people to be in your support network. Ooh, okay. So um, 2020 was a rough year, as I'm sure we are all aware. And it was probably one of my roughest years to date. At the start of 2020, I was feeling really, really lonely in my career because I was the, the only girl in a boys club. And no matter how hard I tried to fit in, I just, I felt like a guest in my own home, if that makes any sense. Um, I could never quite be one of the guys. So I was really looking for mentorship and other women to connect with in the community. And one day I was just bopping around on Twitter and this random person reached out to me and it ended up completely changing my life. Um, that person is a uh, future Dr. Alex Kingsbury, who's all the way in Australia. Um, she reached out to me on Twitter and was basically, you know, well, you can see it here on this slide. So when she reached out to me, I ended up joining the Women in 3D Printing Oceania chapter and waking up at 5 a.m. once a month during the pandemic just to hang out with like the most amazing group of women I've ever met. Um, it's a lot of fun. Please come visit us. <laughs> Examples include Halloween and, you know, just our regular happy hours and get togethers. It's typically like a coffee hour for me, but everyone else is having a good time. So I'm obviously having a good time too. What I didn't know was that once I joined this group, how much I would really need them and how much I would truly be relying on them for the 2020 year. As the year progressed in 2020, things outside of work became much more difficult for me. With the onslaught of, you know, police brutality growing, it was really hard to leave work at work. And then with the pandemic rising, it was also hard to leave work at work because we started the whole work from home phenomena. I only got to work from home for a short period of time because 3D printing is very hands-on, but for the time that I was home, it was incredibly difficult. I would be in meetings or at my desk and I would hear protests and marchers outside. I would hear helicopters hovering overhead in the middle of like big team meetings. I would see people who looked like me being brutalized on television over and over and over again every day. And it was really hard to stay focused as an engineer and it was really hard to get up in the morning sometimes having to see this kind of thing. But having the support network that I did made all the difference. Um, having them call to check on me to see if I was okay, having them reach out to ask if I needed help with anything, if I needed someone to vent to or a shoulder to cry on, really, <laughs> I can't put into words how grateful I am that they found me. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm getting a little choked up even thinking about it. So yes, thank you to my Oceania chapter. You really saw me through like the most difficult time in my career and in my life. Okay, <clears throat> back to the engineering part, solid supports. Um, solid supports on an additive part are basically the supports that are not gonna be removed by hand. They're the supports that hold the part down to the plate most securely. It's made up of a lot of material. So those kinds of supports are like your friends and family. Um, it can be your faith if you're a very religious person, your spouse, um, and again, we're coming back to those core values. Lattice supports, those are typically supports that we remove after the print or after the heat treat process. Uh, they're helpful, but they're mostly just uh, a temporary support. So examples of lattice supports are like classmates, your bosses, even your customers. Sometimes it's your colleagues or your mentors because you can't have more than one mentor. Sometimes it's your professors or people who are members of your team. You, you get where I'm going here, right? All right, so that brings me down to our next section, which is printing. And the most important thing to remember about printing in metal is that sometimes it's up to the laser gods. 
Sometimes you can do everything right, everything perfectly, and the print can still fail. And I want you to know, it's not your fault. It's the laser gods. So here's what you can control when you're printing. You can control how you set up the plates. You can control how much gas or what kind of gas is going in. You can control the kind of material that's going in. You control the build plate temperature and you control how accurately that build plate is leveled. Those are the basic things that you can control when you're setting up the machine. Whenever I click that start button, I always uh, take a deep breath and say this, may the lasers be ever in my favor. <laughs> and it sounds silly, but it really does help me deal with the stress, especially if the build ends up crashing, which it does a lot, but nobody wants to admit it. But I'm telling you, it's okay. It's part of the process. So long as you learn from the mistakes or you try and learn from the crashes, I don't see anything wrong with that. So remember, when you're printing, develop a thick skin because printing is all about failure and how you learn from it. Number two, when you're learning from it, it's okay if you don't know everything. Sometimes a build would crash and I would spend two weeks filling out a report investigating why it crashed. And sometimes people can literally walk by the machine and look into it and say, oh, nope, that's gonna crash because of this reason. And you're gonna be like, well, I didn't know that. Don't let those people fool you. They were in your shoes before and they're just, you know, they had this same kind of experience and that's how they know, okay? Uh, and number three, don't take anything too personally. So whenever my builds used to crash, I used to cry a lot in a broom closet because <laughs> I always thought it was my fault because I designed the file, I sliced the file, I loaded it on the machine and then it crashed and I was the one common denominator. But sometimes it's it's really not about you. It's about the laser gods. And sometimes it just doesn't align. There's a lot of steps going into it, okay? So don't take it too personally. I promise, it'll save you a lot of stress in the long run. Speaking of stress, we're moving on to the next topic, which is heat treatment. Heat treatment. Putting too much on your plate. A brief overview of potato chipping and how not to exceed your own stresses. So as you can see in this cute little diagram, um, you have the part and all the layers are parallel and then at some point something happens and they're no longer parallel. Which brings me to the point, what the heck is potato chipping? So potato chipping or tacoing or the technical term is warping, because that's boring. Um, <laughs> Potato chipping is basically where the stresses in your parts exceed the strength of your plate and then it causes it to pull up. Or in layman's terms, it basically means your part becomes so strong from all the thermal stresses that it literally rips the plate up out of the machine. And it does that funky, wonky potato chipping thing that you see right there in the picture. This is me, but also this is fine. Um, this basically describes what it's like <laughs> when I feel like I'm potato chipping, dog in the fire. Don't act like you're okay when everything is not okay, okay? <laughs> you're gonna get stressed out and so you need to make sure that you have, just like for your out of it parts, a stress relief profile in place to get all of those stresses out or you'll end up ripping off of your supports, ripping off the plate, it's not a pretty picture, I promise. So to understand heat treatment, there are three basic heat treatments. There's stress relief, hipping, which is hot isostatic pressing, and annealing. Each one of these processes will change the material, the material characteristics of your part. So it's really gonna be up to the part's end use and your overall like budget. Most parts will typically only go through stress relief and then a few select parts will go through hip and then only certain types of materials really enjoy annealing. Okay, you got all that? Now, when you are sending your part out to be stress relieved, 
hipped or annealed, you have to provide that supplier with something called a stress relief profile. It's basically the baking instructions. So when you get the part, how long do you bake it for? <clears throat> for my personal stress relief profile, this is what I do. Number one, I get help from my supports. Those, those supports that we, we just reviewed in the previous slides, yeah, I go back to those guys and I ask them for all the help that I can get. Number two, delegate. You've got to spread your parts out. This is a really hard one for people who are control freaks to do. So when you get given a task, the way to delegate is to look at the task and ask yourself, am I the best person for this job? Or is there someone who has better resources available? Does another person have more time? Does another person have more experience? Do I have enough resources available to complete this task? Delegate. Take five minutes. When you're sending out that maybe I'll get back to you email, that, that's the time that you start figuring out if you can delegate the tasks. <sighs> when your print fails and your heart is broken and it's just lying on the floor, one of the things I like to do is just take a deep breath and then count backwards from 10. If it really hurts, then I'll walk it off and take a few laps around the building. And in those moments where I'm being asked for like insane schedules to be met, I like to sit and take five minutes to have another cup of coffee. Cause just the ritual of making myself something and taking care of myself really helps calm me down um, and makes me feel better. And the last thing is to make sure you take time to recharge. Taking time to recharge is probably the most underrated thing on this list. If you start experiencing burnout, you start making mistakes. If you start making mistakes, then builds start crashing and then the cycle just gets more and more toxic. So take time to recharge. Resting is productive work, okay? Don't feel guilty about it. <clears throat> and now for the conclusion. Okay, so far we have covered part design. <laughs> Build setup, printing, and heat treatment. So now we're reaching the end of our time together and I've got to go. So before I do, I'd like to impart a little bit of wisdom that I wish I had known when I started my additive journey. Just because you can print it doesn't mean that you should or even that you have to. When I became an engineer in my first engineering class, Day one, we went over the engineers. The first class I ever had on day one, we went over the engineers creed, which you can see here on the screen. And what stood out to me the most about this creed was dedicating my professional knowledge and skill to the advancement and betterment of human welfare and the public welfare above all. So when I started out in additive, I really wanted to make parts that were going to follow that creed. I really wanted to make parts that I could see having an impact on the world for the better. I wanted to make the world a better place. However, when I, when I got into it, it was vastly different from, from what I had ever imagined. So just because you can print something doesn't mean that you have to. And we're gonna go back to you know, what I talked about earlier. So when I started working at my startup, about a few months into my career, the startup was purchased by their biggest aerospace supplier. Everyone was super excited and like over the moon about this. We were gonna have benefits and it was like, ah. However, I had some reservations because they were an aerospace and defense company. And I didn't know how my overall morals fit into that. And I didn't really understand how I was gonna set boundaries around that. Fortunately, the people that I worked for were very aware of that. And they were very aware of my values because I had set those boundaries early on. So the day before I had to make my decision on whether or not I would stay on and merge with the new company, the director of our site sat me down and we had a very long conversation. And by the end of that conversation, he expressed to me that he really wanted me to stay on and if I was really uncomfortable working for the defense sector, then I wouldn't have to. And I just kind of looked at him and I was like, what? And he was like, well, if you don't want to print defense parts, then how about I just make you the head of our 
space and aerospace division. And I was like, word? <laughs> no lie, I think that's exactly what I said. And he was like, yeah, I'm not gonna make you print anything that you're uncomfortable with. And I was like, huh, okay. That's like really awesome. So I just wanted you all to know that that is possible. If you set your boundaries and you're very upfront about your values, you won't end up in any morally compromising situations. I wanna thank you all for joining me here. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this talk. <sighs> and I'm out.